I was kind of didn't know what to say this morning. I was sitting back uh, there with Brother Egan, and I heard uh, Brother Neville was saying something there looking towards me, and I said to Brother Egan, is he calling me? And he said, he is. And then here I'm up here to say something this morning. I was thinking when I was, the fan there where there t- draws a voice just seems to pull it right out when you're speaking. It seems that the fan takes a voice right away. I was hearing so testimony when I was in there to pray for the woman on the phone and the one who got the message forgot to put the city of the place where to call from Dr. Marson's wife. And I just tell you what I've done for your all's prayer and mine. I laid hands on the phone and pointed to the number, wherever it was, and asked the Holy Spirit to go to the woman. So I Amen. think he hear that just the same as it would be if we Amen. were then. And I just laid it down. And it might be that that's the way the Lord wanted it. Amen. See, it might be, it would be better like that. Amen. And then I heard the testimonies while I was in there. Uh, someone saying that Sister Rook, had, I believe Brother Neville said that she'd had a, a mental collapse like. Yeah. Let's hold on to God for that. Amen. Just remembering this one thing, God knows His own. Amen. He knows all about them. Can you hear all right in the back? If you can't, there's some empty seats up here. You can change if you wish to. <clears throat> and let's see, is this the main mic? This over here is the main mic. Okay. We'll see if we can get that just a teeny bit closer. How about right around here, Gene? That'll be just fine. It's sometimes I get just a little hoarse. I've been preaching quite a bit. Is that better? Can you hear that better? And uh, we certainly remember these in prayer. And we want to report a glorious meeting uh, from down in... Um, uh, am I looking at Sister Rook? No. I thought I looked at a lady back here that looked like her. I thought, surely I'm not talking double here. I looked at someone looked like her towards the back. Um, she's in the St. Edward's Hospital. And uh, so... Uh, at uh, Cleveland, Tennessee, and also in California, we had a glorious meeting. The Lord blessed greatly, and many things that He did. Amen. And we're happy for that. Happy we can come back to our own company reporting the goodness and the mercy of God. Amen. That's the way they did in the Bible. I was appreciating Brother Neville, or Brother Beeler's prayer, how he prayed for the people and, and asking for help and mercy. And if we'll just look along, you always, everything that goes on, you'll find there's something real genuine about it. And then when Brother Neville come and brought these deacons and so forth up here to the platform to to pronounce the blessings of God upon the the church offering. I heard him speaking in his prayer to God about those men, how that they prayed for one another. Amen. And that does me good to hear a pastor that can pray over his deacons and the deacons pray back for the pastor. When you see a church going into cooperation like that, well, something's fixing to move. Amen. That's the way the church has to be in order. And it gave me just an idea for a text. I was going to speak on the blessing at Kadesh and the refusal of the hearing of the report of the spies. But then I changed my mind to something else then. And now concerning healing, I got just a little testimony that I'd like to give. I was in hopes I'd see my boy Billy back there, but he's got it in his pocket. And 
Billy's getting to be better in the meetings than what he used to be. He was nervous, upset, and he'd kind of tell the people, oh, go sit down, go sit down. So I'll give you a prayer card. But I've noticed recently there's getting to be people in the meeting that he just feels so sorry for. If he ain't got no prayer cards left, then he'll put them in a room so I can go pray for him. Amen. And such a thing happened at Chicago the last time. And I'd like to read that letter if, if he does come in. I never got to see him. He didn't know I was coming this morning over here and, uh, and want, want the letter. But I just thought of it when I thought of so much sickness. And here's the way it is. It's a certified letter that I was reading in the paper. I never was told that where the papers was criticizing old Roberts for praying for a woman who had diabetes and died. Now, now I, as an American, I, I like to listen to the laws and, and the man who's in authority, but I think that's not just. Amen. Wonder if they'd be willing to put in the paper all that old Robert had prayed for and got healed that the doctors turned down. I wonder Amen. if they'd swap it yeah. right back around once, yeah. see? Yeah, they, wouldn't they wouldn't do that. And then I think maybe that the devil has just muddled them up so that, and God permitting it, at the day of the judgment, they'll have to answer for that. Amen. But I know of thousands of people that old Roberts has prayed for that's been dying and they're well. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. So you see, they, they are unfair about it. They'll deliver their side, the critical side, but won't deliver the other side. Now the paper is supposed to keep the public uh, up to date on events that happens, yeah. then I think if human beings are concerned with one another, if somebody gets healed, really healed, every paper in the United States ought to pack Amen. the article of it. Amen. Yeah. But you can't harm to do it. No, you take something like that there, they'll snigger and laugh at it and turn it back. But now if there's anything to criticize, it just goes to show that this nation is ready for judgment. Oh, right. And there's got to be judgment and there's no way to escape it. And they're only heaping fire up on their heads and so forth. And such a, a disunified to the principles. A, a paper, its principles is to, to inform the public of anything, good or bad, that's happening. Amen. But they're away from their principles. And when they're keep away from their principles, then they they will not serve their purpose well. And that's the same way it is with the church. When the church is away from its principles, it can never serve the saints well. Amen. We've got to stay together. We've got to be unified. We've got to be one heart and one accord. Or we'll never serve God or the people. Unless we're one heart and one accord to stand by the principles of the Bible. And the things that God has said, that's right. Amen. We must always stand by them. Amen. Billy stuck into the room at Chicago. He, someone come to him, a woman with her husband with cancer on the lungs, dying, and his wife was a polio victim in a wheelchair. And her trying to take care of a man that couldn't hardly stand up with cancer on his lungs. And Billy said to him, he said, I, I'm sorry, sir. He said, I'd gladly give you a prayer card. And he said, but I, I haven't got another one left. And he said, well, all right, sonny. He said, that's all right. He said, we tried to get here, but it's so unhandy for us. Billy said, tell you what you do. He said, I'm going to get Dad, and I'm going to bring him in, and I'll take him out. And he said, when I do... As soon as you hear his message, said then you get your uh, your wife and you, and get into a little room there where I pass through, and I'll have him pray for you. Oh, he said that's loyal, son. That's good enough. See, there's a, there's an attitude. See, nice. good enough. That's fine. Yeah. And that night, Billy, when he went back there, still against what he had said, that he had his brother-in-law there who was. Bleeding with hemorrhages from the lungs. And his sister-in-law there, who was bleeding from the stomach with ulcers. Also, that they'd come in with him. 
kind of on the side of helping them get in. You have to watch it be a whole room full, you see. But going through and praying for them, we get a letter back through the mail that that man has perfectly healed of that cancer of his lungs. Amen. The woman, the wife in the wheelchair is up going around just normally as she ever was. Amen. The man with the hemorrhages of the, of the lungs from tuberculosis is t- completely well and his wife is well of the ulcers. Amen. Four of them healed straight. Amen. I wonder if the newspapers Amen. would be willing to print that. Amen. See? Oh, but God still is God. <laughs> he Amen. just does things in His own way, you know. And he's so good. We're so happy to know that He is God. Amen. We was talking the other morning about a little preacher that we know that used to go around and pray for the sick and everything. And he went and prayed for a person in the hospital in Louisville and a tuberculosis case, a lady dying. The little fellow said, well, there's no need. God ain't there. No, God can keep His word. But I know her just like, like the Bible said. If he don't keep his word, he's not God. So it's just a book. Now, that would seem like that unless you know God. That's Amen. part of the Scriptures, but it's not all of the Scriptures. Uh, it's Amen. up on the basis of the faith of the Amen. individual. See? And I told my wife, I said, there's been so many things happen that I... Just know that there is. I don't know what's going to happen to me at the end. I may go the same way. If God ever moves His hand of mercy from me, I'll go the same way. But as long as He'll keep His hand of mercy and guidance upon me, I'll go on. But I asked media, I said, who was it in the room that morning after the vision of me seeing my little girl, Sharon? By the way, the other day, I like to fainted. I was sitting on the street, and you know my story of the vision of her at you. And I looked, coming by my side, and there come a young girl down the street here in Jeffersonville. was just exactly like that vision. I just had to grasp my hands together. Looked so much like that vision of my little Sharon. She's a young woman then. And after that vision that morning, when in glory I... Hope was telling me, had her arm around my shoulder saying, don't worry about us, Bill. We're better off. I was just trying to commit suicide. And she said, don't worry. Promise me you won't worry anymore. And I said, I can't promise it, Hope, because I, I, I'm, I weary. I can't help it. And I come out of the vision standing in the dark room. And not a vision, not an imagination, but her arm was still around me. Amen. And she was patting me. I thought, wait a minute. This is not, I didn't know what to call it in them days, a vision. I called it a trance. I said, this is, her hand's still there. I said, are you here, Hope? She said, Bill, promise me that you won't worry anymore about me and Sharon. Because I was at the end of the road. I was ready to commit suicide. I said, I promise you. And she hugged me and patted me with her hand. Amen. And then I I said, Hope, where are you? I got felt up to got a hold of a little chain on the light and pulled it. I went around, searched through every chair to see if she was sitting there. He's God. He's just as much God today as he was on Mount Transfiguration when Moses and Elijah appeared. He's still God. We may go through lots of troubles and trials. Just remember there's someone who knows. Lights the way. Makes it real. I do not know what's behind the curtain. But I know one thing. I'm pressing towards the mark of the high calling. Every day trying to live for that great event that will take place someday when I shall see him face to face. And tell the story saved by grace. That's the day I live for. Leaving those things behind which are, I want to press on. Just keep going. I want this tabernacle, now that you're on your feet, I want you to keep pressing towards the mark of the high calling. Whatever you do, cling together. Be as clannish as you can be. But always with an arm out to reaching at someone else to bring them in. 
But in this faith that we're now preaching and earnestly contending for, don't you move one inch from it. Amen. For if you believe me to be his servant, this is the program of God. Yeah. It'll never be in the majority. It'll always be in the minority. Always has and always Amen. will be. But remember, it is written, Fear not, little flock, it's your Father's good will to give to you the kingdom. Amen. Now, there is a group of officers of our church, deacons, trustees, Sunday school superintendent, pastors, as our church is set in order. And you, the people, elected these officers and this pastor. I'm just gentle overseer. See, it goes on right and to give advice and so forth. You are the one who elects your pastor. You elect your trustees. You elect your deacons. You elect every officer is in this church. You, the people. And it's your duty to stand by those men. See, for... They'll make mistakes. They're mortal. They're just man. And they'll make mistakes. But if the president of the United States makes a mistake, do we throw him out as president? We forget about it and move on. That's the way we want to do our church. Now, I was listening to him pray a few minutes ago for those deacons and to hear back there a testimony at the door from the trustees how that with one accord, you all are. Now stay that way. Now you members stand by these trustees, deacons, and pastor. And remember, when you get this together, remember that it's the devil's business to see that that's broke up. Now it's always has been and it always will be. But you stand by your officers. And that was a talk that I was going to make. And then I have here also some, something for the bulletin board this morning about the meeting of the boards and their authority. And it'll be on the bulletin board. And I got a copy for Brother Roberson, who is the chairman of the, D, of the trustees. And then I got a copy for Brother Collins, I think, who acts as the chairman of the deacon board. And now all these offices are set according to the Scripture and they must have the scriptural rules of what they must do. Therefore, the trustees has an office of their own and the deacons has an office of their own. The Sunday school superintendent has an office of his own and the pastor is the head of the flock. Now, each one of these has things in common. And I think that your meeting should not be together, but it should be as each office, because the deacons has nothing to say to the trustees unless they got some business to present to them. And vice versa, the trustees is over the finance and things of the building. They have nothing with the deacons. The deacons are the policemen of the church and the assistants to the pastor, and the trustees is the holding of all the property. The trustees has nothing to do with the spiritual end of it and the deacon has nothing to do with the financial end of it. Therefore, it must be... And the Sunday school superintendent is over his Sunday school. So I've got it all wrote, typed out to be on the bulletin board and then we are also going to get in a frame the doctrine that the church stands for and have it framed in here in the church. Amen. What we stand for, the, the principles the doctrine of the church. Now, to be a church, we've got to have a doctrine. We don't draw down any stakes and say, we just go this far. We go out just this far with fellowship with everybody that God will let us go in His Scriptures with the people. Now, stick together, be of one accord, one heart, and move on for God. That's the way God wants us to do. Now, let us pray and then open the Word. Oh, precious Lord, we are now about to approach the divine word or the reading of this word. May your Holy Spirit interpret to us that which we have need of. And let us 
Be, Lord, and act and live knowing that we are all your children by grace as you have called us. May there be a fellowship in this church, seeing that we are just about to emerge into some great move we feel of bringing up other ministers to go out into the fields of where if you shall send me into the different parts of the world, there to establish the faith and to have a minister ready and willing and trained to take over. And may the faith that was once delivered to the saints that we are gallantly standing for become a circle around the world. Grant it, Lord. And may this little weed pile as it was one day when we dedicated it to you, may there be a church rise up here, Lord, that out of it shall go ministers and advances and teachers and missionaries to all parts of the world. We would ask this morning a special blessing for our brothers and sisters Stricker who's suffering now. But we know that we're all put to these tests. Every son that cometh to God must be chastened, tried, and if we give up easy and turn back, then we are illegitimate children and not the children of God. Give brother and sister Stricker strength and power to stick to their post of duty. If they have to beg what food they eat, Let thy hand of blessing be upon them. For we know not, but it might be through that very effort that you'd show the native of Africa what a real Christian is. Grant it, Lord. Now let it all be done according to thy will. Bless this pastor, Brother Neville. We pray, Lord, that you'll make him a shepherd of the flock as you have in past. And we would not forget his lovely a little wife who is very sick. The enemy would like to leave Brother Neville with that group of children with no mother. But we stand in place by our faith, the Amen. blood of Jesus Christ, between that enemy and our sister. May your spirit, Lord, be great upon her, knowing that all women are ordained to walk down through this valley of darkness of this age. We pray that you'll be with her. Bless those little children. She'll be nervous now and fretful. But may the Holy Ghost be at the door of mercy at all times for that family. Bless our trustee board, our brother Wood and our brother Egan, brother Roberson, and all of the others, Lord Deacons, trustees, and All that's associated in the church, we pray, Lord, that you'll let them serve their term with holiness and and righteousness. Bless those, Lord, who have served in the times past. And we pray that you'll continue to be with all of us, that we will be known as a church of unity and spirit and love of the Lord. We pray now that you'll divide to us the word as we have need as we read out of thy written word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And in praying, I was thinking as we were blessing or asking blessings for our modern, our new board of trustees and so forth. I was thinking of our brother Fleeman and brother Dietzman and them sitting here who has served well on before. We want to be thankful to God for their loyal service. May the Lord ever be with them to bless them and to help them. I want to read before, just remember now, the bulletin board and so forth and the coming meetings. And we're happy to have with us this morning... Well, uh, I might say it like this, a man who has been very precious to me in times past and precious now, a good brother, Fred Softman from, and his wife from Saskatchewan, Canada, who is here to sojourn with us 
in our nation a sojourner, but in our fellowship a beloved brother. Amen. Brother Fred Softman sitting there. He manages the campaign for me when I was in Canada. And another precious brother who is also formerly a Canadian, which was a businessman and can prove to the world that you can't outgive God. He and his buddy formed a foundation for finances of building a place or for a foreign mission, a foundation. They called me to Oakland for a meeting and said they had the money they'd sponsor it all in their foundation. Brother Fred and I tried that for some money that Brother Fred had that I would not take as an individual. So then we decided we would give it to the Canadian people and not even take up an offering. But it didn't go so good. The meetings were fine. But because we didn't take up an offering, I don't care if the church is worth a hundred billion dollars, you still owe it to God to take up an offering. That's part of the worship. And you rob that, as much as I've been against money and things like that, I find out when a man's wrong, you might as well admit you're wrong. Because Brother Fred and I see it pan out not so good. And Brother Borders, when I left Brother Fred and come down to you at Oakland, I said, don't you do it. You just pass the collection plate. And take up an offering. And whatever it is, put it back in your foundation for another meeting somewhere. And before the service is closed, Brother Border and his friends come to me and said, as much as we put into the, the meeting is already took up. Amen. And then a few days ago, he made arrangements for a meeting in San Jose, California, where he had some, I guess, 60 or 70 churches in the valley of all different faiths, all cooperating. We had a wonderful meeting and returning back again in November. We're happy to have you with us, Brother Borders and Brother Fred sitting back there. And um, these men, as strangers maybe to you all, but they've been precious brothers to me, out in the fields contending earnestly for the faith that we're standing for. God bless you, brother. We're glad to have you this morning in the little old tabernacle here. It's not much to look upon. But there's something here that we know that God lives here, you see. Amen. So we're happy for that. And these other precious brethren, if I had time to mention, that's with us today. Now, I am anticipating and praying that in the next few days, the Lord willing, I want to go feeling led. I haven't made the announcement. The next meeting to Ohio to be with Brother Sullivan on the campgrounds. Within a, sh a short time, it's only about 100 miles up there, I guess, Gene, something like that. It'd be a fine trip if you haven't planned your vacation if the Lord continues to lead us. Very fine man, and a, we appreciate Brother Sullivan a great deal. Just a, he's a mayor of the city uh, and was just ex-mayor, and just an old-fashioned Kentucky, and that's all I can say about him. When I met him the other day, and we was both raised down there in the mountains of Kentucky, or he said to me, have you still got your ass affinity around your neck, Billy? <laughs> you know how, how uh, Kentucky he is. Now, let's turn in, no disregards to my Kentucky brethren here, uh, brother uh, Jeffries and so forth. I'm a Kentuckian too, you know. I'll tell you one thing we are. We are not Kentuckians, or neither are we Americans. We are pilgrims and strangers. We're Amen. seeking a city to come. Now, for our reading, let's read out of the book of Exodus for a few minutes. I wish to read from the 23rd chapter and the 20th verse to the 23rd inclusive. Now, I want to take a text this morning from like this, uh, of this, rather, a uh, total deliverance. And I won't be long speaking. Now, while I was waiting for you to turn to your book and chapter, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee to the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. I'm sure that the congregation knows who this angel was. My name is in him. 
And if thou will indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then will I be an enemy unto thy enemies and an adversary unto thy adversaries. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee unto the Amorites, the Hatites, Persianites, Canaanites, Havites, and Jupanites, and I will cut them off. May the Lord bless His Word as we Amen. speak now for a few minutes, if you pray. I was thinking on this subject of a total deliverance. The church has been in the in the minority. It always will be in members until Jesus comes. But it's living under its God-given privileges. If we only knew this is the church of the living God, not the Branham Tabernacle, but the Branham Tabernacle is just part of it. There's other such tabernacles through the country. Brother Snelling tonight is having a baptismal service. I forgot Brother Curtis told me to announce that or told me yesterday he's having it. He's having a baptismal service and if anyone here has never been baptized, uh, yet uh, Brother Snelling would be glad to do that tonight. That's the hole in his tabernacle at Utica. And uh, Brother Junior Jackson in New Albany. And there's many such churches throughout the country. But we're all living, seem like, on the defeated side, more or less. I heard Brother Neville announce this morning back there that it kind of come to my mind that the people seemingly are getting away from deliverance. It seems to be something that the people seen it, so they just push it out to one side. Oh, well, God can do it. But that's not the attitude. Now, Moses, when he was called by God, he was a total, complete prophet. When God sends a man to do anything, he completely equips him with everything that he has need of. If God calls a man to be a preacher... He puts something in him to preach with. If he calls him to be a teacher, he puts something in him to teach with. If he calls for him to be a prophet, he puts something in him to see visions and to be a prophet. God always completely equips his man. And that's just what he'd done when he sent Moses into Egypt. He raised him up in a certain a way. And he schooled him in a certain way. And he molded him and made him and fashioned him. After he had promised Abraham hundreds of years before that he would deliver the people, then he, he had in mind that he would make Moses just the way Moses was made. Moses was a complete prophet. And then being a complete prophet, then just like you, if you are a Christian, God don't make any halfway Christians. God makes complete Christians. God don't make halfway preachers. But the preacher can be halfway. And God makes His children Christians, but sometimes they're halfway Christian. But it's not God's intention for them to be that way. It's their own ways got mixed up with the plan of God for their life, and that's what makes them the way they are. God don't want them to be halfway Christians or halfway preachers compromising on either side or he wants them to completely stand in the breach. Amen. Now, Moses, God had made him a complete 
prophet for a complete deliverance. And Moses was completely surrendered into the hands of God. That's the reason it made him what he was. He was so complete in God till God could trust him. I wonder this morning as Christians, if we have yielded our own will and yielded ourselves so completely to God, to God can trust us. The place that He has put us. I wonder this morning of myself, if I could be so yielded to God, to God could trust me. Could trust Brother Neville. Could trust our trustee board, our deacon board, our, our members of our church. We all have a place and we got a duty. The minister's got a place of duty to stand and preach the unsearchable riches of Christ without compromising. If he's called to be a preacher, he wouldn't spare one thing for one person if he's called to be a preacher. And the member of the church, he's called to be a member of this certain group that he would not compromise if the church believes that we should not gamble, then that member should never touch a deck of cards. We don't believe in drinking. He should turn his head completely from drinking. If we do not believe in gambling or smoking, the member of this church should never touch such a thing. God gives complete deliverance. When we will do it, if we'll completely surrender ourselves to Him. If we will completely deliver ourselves into His hand, then God can live in us. Christ, the hope of glory. Amen. He can reflect Himself from us as we get ourselves out of the way. Then our thoughts are His thoughts. Could you imagine Christ smoking a cigar? Could you imagine Christ drinking or playing cards? Then if your spirit is part of His spirit, He wants it to be upon your confession, but you permit the devil to come in and take over it. And all the time in your heart, way down deep, you know you're wrong when you do those things. And when a, one member would talk against the other member, you know that's wrong. You're commanded to pray for one another. Not to talk against one another. But to love one another. And if someone is down, let's pick him up. Help him. Now, that makes us a, a, a unified group of believers. Now, when we don't obey that, then we don't obey God and we displease God. And therefore, our church, our people cannot prosper. The church cannot go on. It's because we're disunified together. As Jesus said, a little leaven leavens the lump. Now, if the uh, a church board, uh, like the, the deacons, would come and say that we were to uh, uh, thinking we should build a new tabernacle, if that is the vote of the deacons and the trustees are consulted and they don't have the money to do it, then they have a building program like we have going on now. And then it's stuck over the general audience as we should be, all the church being sovereign. Then if the church votes for the new tabernacle, then we all should cooperate together in building that new tabernacle. Amen. Frankly, myself, 
when they spoke of new tabernacle to me, I was against the thought. That's right. I said, we don't need exactly a new tabernacle. I'll probably be leaving here pretty soon as the Lord, if it, what He show me comes to pass. What do we need with the new tabernacle? We haven't got the money. Then I come down and felt the feeling of the church. That the church in the majority seemed to want it. Then what did I do? I sacrificed my own thoughts and throwed in with the church. Amen. Sure, let's do it. Yep. That's the way we cast lots. That's the way it was in the Bible time. The way the church voted. The, the sovereignty, the groups of the people. They come together in unity their strength. So therefore, I said, certainly, if that's the way the church wants, if that's what God is wanting, He's got more of authority to vote among a whole group of people than he has to me because I have no vision to say that it shouldn't be. So we throw in with the church and move with the church. Amen. I'm behind it to do all that I can to help out the church. That should be the motive of every Christian and every person in the church is for uh, to unify ourselves and stick together. Whatever the church votes for, that's what we should stand for. Then say, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, want to change something in the church. Well, then if the trustees want to do the somebody else wants to do the deacons, they want to change something that comes before the church. The church then together. And if our if our idea here seems to be a little different from what the whole church says, let's sacrifice that idea Amen. because that's the only way we can stand united. And if this church will just Go on the way you're going now and be united together. God will. It's unlimited what He'll do. Amen. If we'll stick together, Amen. we must stick together. That's how we want to be so complete with one another and then so complete in the hands of God. Amen. Then we've got to have a man that we believe that preaches the Word of God. If the man don't do it, then get somebody who does do it. Amen. Amen. That's the way we must stand. If the trustee board won't stand for what's right, then it's your business to elect somebody who will stand for what's right. Amen. And then when you do it, stay by it. Yeah. It's up to you. Amen. Stand by it. And all together we're standing for one thing. That's God. Amen. If a member makes a mistake, don't turn him down. Help him. Raise him up. Get together. Have a hearing with one another. It's what the Scripture says. When we make a mistake, let's go before God. Before we can go before God, we got to go before the person we hurt. I just had to do that. Amen. And I know what I did wrong. I lied. Caused my wife to lie. I believe I've told you about it here at the church. There's a few days of... Not long ago, it's been about six weeks ago, the attorneys had me so tore up over this investigation that I hardly knew where I was at. I just went home from the office to eat dinner, and the private phone number rang. And Meady went to answer the phone. She put her hand over and said, it's them attorneys again. I said, I couldn't stand another evening. My head feels like it's drawing off. I'm losing my mind. Just pulling me this way and that way and this way. I said, I can't stand it. And I jumped up and I said, tell them I'm not in here. And run around behind the house. When I come back, Needy's very conscientious of those things. She met me at the door half crying. She said, Bill, was that the right thing to do? You know how you are. I know how I am. I said, sure, I wasn't in here right then. I knew God had condemned me for it. I said, I wasn't in here right then. I said, but you was in here when he made the call. That afternoon, I went to pray for a sick baby. And before I left the house, the phone rang again, and little Joseph ran over and took hold of the phone and said, Daddy, you want me to tell him you're not here? You see how sin crops? What a family that would finally be! First John the fifth chapter in the 21st verse said, If our hearts condemn us not, 
then we have confidence in God. But if our hearts condemn us, how can we have confidence in God? We know as long as we got sin that's not confessed, He'll never hear us. That's strong, but it's, it's, if the church needs these things, then I started to pray for this baby. And when I started to lay my hands on it, the Lord rebuked me and said, You told a lie. You ain't fit to pray for that baby. I turned away from the man. I said, Sir, you just wait here. I've got something to make right. I called up the attorney and went down to the office. Called him in. I said, look, sir, I told a lie. I had my wife to lie. She said I wasn't in there and I ran out behind the house and I confessed it and told him about it. Walked up and put his hands on my shoulder. He said, Brother Graham, I've always had confidence in you, but I've got more than ever now. A man, he said, it's willing to make right his wrongs. And I told him, I said, I started to pray for a baby. And the Lord would just condemn me my heart because I know I had done wrong. Then the next day, wife said, where are you going? I said, to my cave. And I went up to my cave up above Charleston where I've been going for years. And I got in there and I prayed all that day. Oh, God, don't never let me do a thing like that again. You forgive me, Lord. For when I start to put my hands on the sick people to pray, then it's condemned. Amen. Long about three o'clock in the evening, I come out and there's a big rock lays out there. And I got on that rock and was looking up towards the east with my hands up, praising the Lord. And it's just so quiet in there. And I said, Lord, if you'll just... One time you passed by Moses and he said it was the when you had him in the cleft of the rock and it looked like the back part of a man. I said, could you do it again, Lord? Let me know I'm forgiven. And I said, if you help me and come on my mind, I said, Lord, I, I'm not very strong mentally because I have no education. I said, and I, I'm trying to serve you. You know my heart. And I didn't ought to have done that. I didn't mean to do that. My head just felt like it was coming off. I was so nervous. And I'd done it in a catch of a moment when Satan caught me. I said, if you forgive me, let me see you, the Lord. God be my judge just right over to my side. A little place of bushes begin to whirl like a wind. And they come right along the side of the cave where I was at and went down through the woods. Oh, brother, a peace that passes all understanding swept over me. And I Amen. cried, I wept, I shouted. I know my sins were forgiven me. Praise See, Lord. I was disunified with God. Amen. I couldn't have deliverance for the baby. I, and the very next day, there's a man from Chicago who is a great man, a Catholic, just converted. The valves in his heart are swelled out like an inflated inner tube. And they've been trying to cut him out for a long time. It was going to, and he wouldn't let them. Finally, he found an interview. Them interviews, we stay right with it till we find out what's wrong. And the man had no more come in. So the Holy Spirit went back down to his life and called out something he'd done when he was an altar boy. In the Catholic Church, he said, that's the truth, that's the honest truth. I said, you mean that was against me? I said, that's the only shadow that I can see in your life. Went back up and told the doctor, said, all right, get things together now. We'll have the operation. The doctor said, we'll check that old ticker again. And when he looked into it, he said, you don't need the operation. Amen. See, if our hearts condemn us, we want complete deliverance. We don't want to be halfway church. We want to be a real church or no church at all. We want to be real Christians or no Christians at all. We want total deliverance from our habits, from our sins, from our evil thinking, from our evil doing, from our negligence. Whatever we've done, we want total deliverance. So that when people come into this church to be prayed for, there will be just this little group, maybe not over a hundred or two sitting here, but they'll be completely in the hands of God. Amen. And when we pray, then God will hear from heaven. God wants somebody that He can hold in His hand. Somebody that He can say, i got confidence in. 
I can send this my sick servant to the Branham Tabernacle of Jeffersonville and that group of people are one accord. Something will happen. Well, look what he does for us in the condition that we're in. What would he do if we were one heart and one accord? The only way we can do that is unify our hearts together with brotherly love. Obey the offices of the church and the pastor and the pastor obey God. Then God works through the pastor, through the board, down into the church and all together are one unit to the kingdom of God. Then God will hear when we have a unified group. Let nothing bother you. Don't be dismayed in anything. Now, that's the kind of a person that God ordained to take the lamb. Moses was complete. He was a man that wouldn't compromise. If there were stews and fusses and so forth, he wouldn't compromise. That's what God wants us now. Pharaoh wanted to agree, said to Moses, you all can go. How about you leave your children behind? Or at least some of your cattle back here. That's the way the devil wants a Christian to come. It'll be all right for you to join the church, but don't you never forgive Jones. It'll be all right if you can bring in your, if you can go, hey, you don't have to give up your smoking, your drinking. You're lying, you're stealing, you're fault-finding, backbiting. You don't have to give that up. Just join the church. But Moses wasn't a compromiser. He wanted complete deliverance. He said, we'll not leave one hoof behind. We'll take everything that belongs to us when we go to worship the Lord. That's the way the church ought to be. We'll take righteousness. We'll take holiness. We'll take the Holy Spirit. We'll take a unified group when we go to the altar. We'll be a real group. We'll leave nothing behind. We'll take everything. There won't be one hoof stay back here. You know when people can pray in such a way to the devil, I have to give in. That's the way Moses and his group did. They got over there and got under the blood. You notice, until they got under the blood, there was no total deliverance. Amen. Moses himself, he was unified with God, but Israel wasn't. There still it was sin, and they murmured against Moses. And they said, why, why do you do this? You bring more trouble upon us. Because Pharaoh just doubled their tally of bricks and so forth. That was Moses. He was completely in the hands of God. Totally delivered from sheep herding. Amen. To herd God's sheep. Amen. He was totally delivered himself. But the people wasn't delivered because there was still murmuring among them. One night when God ordained that a lamb should be killed. Amen. Type of Christ. And the blood was dipped in hyssop, which is weeds. Common, humble. And put over the lintel of the door and on the post. That's when Israel become completely delivered. Amen. With not a hoof left behind. All that belonged to them was delivered. Amen. Their families, their loved ones, and everything was delivered when they completely come under the blood. Hallelujah. That's when the church shall be completely delivered. When everything comes under the blood. Amen. When your sins come under the blood. When you're smoking, when you're gambling, when you're cheating, when you're stealing, when you're lying. When everything is brought under the blood, then there will be a total deliverance. If you wrong somebody, make it right. You can't bring that under the blood, it won't stay. You can't bring it, something won't let you do it. When yourself is completely, totally brought under the blood, there will be a total deliverance. Then you'll have a freedom like you've never known before. Amen. When everything's brought in the blood, brought in submissive to the kingdom of God, then there will be a real deliverance. Jesus was completely, totally man. He could cry like a man. 
He could eat like a man. He could be tired like a man. He was completely, totally man in his physical being. And in his spirit, he was completely, totally God. Amen. So he made his flesh submissive to the spirit that was in him. Amen. You see, he was tempted in all manners like we are. He was man, not an angel. He was a man. He had desires and temptations. Just like we do. The Bible said he did. He was a man, not an angel above temptation. Hebrews 1 said that he was, uh, Hebrews 1, 4 said he was made lower than the angels. He was man. Completely man. That God took a complete man to bring total deliverance. Amen. And he filled him with his spirit. The Holy Ghost was in him without measure. And he was tempted like we were. And he was completely God. He proved it when he raised the dead. When he stopped nature. The roaring seas and the mighty winds. When he spoke to the trees and so forth, they obeyed him. He was God inside. And he could have been man. Or he was man. But he totally and completely delivered himself as a man into the hands of God for the service of God. And he is our example. We are men and women. We're also Christians. If he's our example, let us completely deliver ourselves into the hands of the Holy Ghost. We might be subjects of the kingdom of God. He was totally man. He was totally God. But he surrendered his natural parts to his and his physical parts and his own thinking and his own doing and his own cares. And I do only that which pleases the Father. There you are. Totally delivered from human beings. The priests come to him, the great man, and said, Rabbi so-and-so, and tried to bribe him into their affiliations and denominations. But he was totally delivered because he trusted in God. Did not the psalmist say, Thou will deliver him, for he has completely trusted in me. I will deliver my darling from the dogs because he has trusted in me. Some hour when we come to the end of life's journey, I want it for mine. I know you want it for yours. I want him to say, I'll deliver him out of the jaws of death. For he's trusted in me. I will deliver him from the grave on the resurrection morning. Totally deliver him, both soul, body, and spirit. Because he has trusted in me. All Jesus' works was complete. Everything was complete. Total delivered. He totally delivered the leper from leprosy. He totally delivered the woman with a blood issue from her issue. He totally delivered the world from sin when he died at the day of the atonement. He totally delivered every sin. He delivered the church. So there's no need for us to live underprivileged people. There's no need for us to live in a defeated state because he defeated the devil and took all the principalities and powers and subdued them under his feet and they have no legal rights to rule over you. We are Christians filled with the Holy Ghost. We don't have to have the devil dictate to us. Christ delivered us. Total deliverance. Delivered us from evil. Delivered us from sin. Delivered us from habits. Delivered us from talking. Delivered us from, from black guard. Delivered us from all kinds of smutty things. He totally delivered us and put us into His holy hands. Amen. 
a complete, total deliverance. He delivered our sickness. He delivered us from sickness. For we have an abstract deed to that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. He is our healer. That's why that poor little polio woman trying to take care of a cancer dying husband. She walked into the rims in the presence of God. She had faith and she, the doctors had done all they could do. So she followed God's instructions and was totally delivered. The disciples had total deliverance. Absolutely total deliverance. Why? Because they were completely and totally filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. When you just a church member and shook the pastor's hands or some had some kind of a little uh, experience of jumping, shouting, or speaking in tongues or something other and still have malice in your heart, strange acts, telling lies, smoking cigarettes, Lusting after women. There's something hasn't happened yet. There's something wrong. For he that loves the world or the things of the world, the love of God's not in him. You've been misled. By their fruit you shall know them. We all want to be unified together with the Holy Spirit. Every member should be unified one with the other. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. It cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Amen. We are delivered from the things of the world. Jesus said, This will all men know that you're my disciples. When you got love one for the other. When one member loves the other member so much that it would die for it. When one evil thing starts the outside world, some of the women come along and say, Now look, dear, it would be better for you if you did this or do that wore this or did that or done this and got away from that bunch of holy rollers or so forth like that. We are so unified with God. Amen. You say, well, Brother Brown, it's an awful temptation. But Christ died for that purpose. The devil is defeated. Amen. We want total deliverance. We want a church that's pure and clean and unadulterated and washed in the blood of the Lamb and filled with the Holy Spirit and signs and wonders and miracles. Deliver everyone. Dear God, you don't take things unless it's totally delivered. You cannot receive a sacrifice with a blemish on it. You will never receive a prayer that there's sin back in the life of that person. You just could not do it. Lord, you didn't do it. The age has gone by and you can't do it today. But the sacrifice must be without blemish. Lord God, as we lay ourselves on the altar, as sacrifice life, take from us, O Lord, all blemishes of sin. I completely lay my soul and my body and my strength and my efforts with this church this morning on the altar. Cleanse us by thy blood. And forgive us of every sin that we have did. And may the great Holy Spirit so richly abide in us in his presence. Go with us from this tabernacle this morning. That we'll know within ourselves that he has forgiven us. Then the prayer will be, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Grant it, Lord. Be thou near us now. Bless us and keep us until we meet again at the evening service. May we come in with clean hands and a pure heart that you'll not turn down. For we want a complete and total deliverance from anything, Lord, that would keep us from being the light of the world. A candle that's set on a hill not a bushel over it, but a candle that sets on the hill that gives light to guide people's feet in the way that's right. Grant it, Father. 
We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. I'm going to ask Doc. I think he's back there. One of the deacons is present. That the church might read this. Doc, come put this on the bulletin board so the church can see it as they go out. And then Brother Collins, if he's here, is Brother Collins in? Give him his other. And, all right, sir. And we'll see what to. had someone wanting an interview, that's always granted. Uh, we are glad, and I have interviews. You see, the thing you do is call our number out there. We, we had so much trouble up the house. The church knows that this is strangers. Um, the church knows about it. There should be a little a piece put. I'll have it placed here in the church, too, for the oncomers. You see, there's so many that we can't take care of them all just as they come by number. See, and we... And if you'll just call Butler 21519. Butler and any of the members that sees anyone that wants... I'm always glad to see people, but we have a regular system. There's some already called, several, see? And we just come by one by one as we come. Then there's, it used to be we just had kind of a haphazard hit anyway. Skip hop. Uh, people went home disappointed and everything. Now they have everything just in order. And that's what we're trying to speak of now, see? Put everything in order. Just perfectly. And I'll be glad to see this dear party if they'll just call Butler 2, 1519, 1519. And Mr. Mercer or Mr. Goldblum will answer the phone and tell you just exactly when you can have an appointment. we got a place out there, air-conditioned and ready to receive the people and pray for them. We're only happy to do it. Now, the reason I don't come to church that people think I try to get away from the people, it isn't. I'm trying to, to be exactly in order. See, that's what I want to be. Just won't show respect to person. Each person, anybody, anywhere, anytime. See, color, creed has nothing to do with it. We come right there and meet the people. And if they have a need, we stay right with God until it's solved. If they want to know anything about meetings, of course, we take care of it and follow it. That's only the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that's, that way, I think it's just. It does everyone just exactly the same. Therefore, there's no respect to person. No respect. Was there any people that come to be prayed for this morning that was sick and want to be prayed for. All right? If there's not, then let's sing the good song for, the, for worship. What can we sing this morning? What can take away my sin? You know what, Teddy? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can... Oh, right, sir. You want to pray for her now? I'm going to pray for that lady... Lay hands on this woman here. Would you bow your heads with me? Quietly. Dear God, there's a lady that's very sick. Our sister has put her body up even to take cancer from others. It's standing the breach for others. But you deliver her from that woman. A few days ago when those things were known, just let her find it out herself, Lady Lord, she'll know that it comes to me. I'll lay my hands up on her and ask for mercy. May the grace of God, the power of the Holy Ghost, Amen. there be any evil in our hearts, Lord, reveal it to us first, and we will make it right. Amen. That we know that we have favor with God, we have peace with God, we get what we ask for because we have no condemnation. Amen. Grant it, Lord, in Jesus' name, my friend. Amen. Amen. What can I show away my sins but the blood of Jesus? Oh, what can make me hold again? Nothing but the blood.
many feels that all your sins are under the blood? Let's sing it with our hands up now. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, as you drop your hands, let's shake hands around them. Precious is our hope that makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You love him? Stay with it now. Everybody, hold on to God. Ah. 